For the past several weeks, we've been journeying with those ancient Hebrews who were learning day by day what freedom meant and at what cost it comes and just how hard it is to accept. We don't think of freedom as something that's hard. We think of it as something that should be a baseline. But what so many of us know, what so many of us go and tell our therapists about week after week is that finding freedom is actually really hard. Finding your freedom from whatever chains hold you back, from systems of oppressions, to family relationships enshrined in love and so much more, to identity and making a way in a world today, making a way as really anyone with an individual identity rather than trying to be whatever the cultural norms of the past times have said they should be. We've wandered with those ancient Hebrews. We've seen them struggle. We've seen them give up faith altogether. And we've seen God almost lose it and then be reminded by a human that love is the way. And we see God soften. We see the Almighty become not just a warrior, but a comforter, a time of great help for these people that were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years had come through many, many, many generations of slavery and needed God's help. And they didn't know how to ask except to melt their jewelry into a golden calf, hoping somewhere that their God would be greater still than this God. And our God was and is. Now we're going to leave those Hebrews right where they are right now, camped out by the foot of Sinai. They're all, they're all better right now. They've got their manna in the morning and quail in the evening. They're figuring it out. They're going to burn away that stench of slavery as they journey ever closer and closer to the land of freedom. We are too. And today we're going to turn our attention to these two letters that we hear from Aaron. A letter from Paul, or somebody calling himself Paul, and a letter to a community that is known as a gospel, to Matthew's community, a love letter from Matthew to his people, the Jewish people, of a Jewish Messiah sent by a Jewish God for their salvation. And we begin with Paul. When the Apostle Paul writes to any of his churches, any of the churches in the New Testament, the 13 books that we have from Paul, he begins and he ends with words of good cheer. We heard those this morning. And often these words of good cheer at the beginning and benediction at the end sandwich some real theological sticky wickets and corrections and punishments and admonishments and some tricky theology that people probably aren't that ready to hear then and maybe still not ready to hear now and we can now tell you why you shouldn't have to hear this. But the beginning and the ends are always filled with love. And this is a pattern, this sandwiching bad news in between two pieces of good news or of love is a pattern that many innovators or parents, dramaturgs, doctors and critics have copied ever since. Sandwich the bad news in between some good and Hopefully nobody will get too upset. We all do this from time to time. And I'm sure many of us have had it blow up in our faces from time to time as well, or, or perhaps we've been the one to blow it up in another's face. Nevertheless, as a written form, as a method for helping people hear us, it has its advantages. And on the other hand, if taken to the extreme, it can be quite damaging. It can be manipulative. It can be sugarcoating. It can be gaslighting. Holding the tension is important. 
holding two contradictory feelings or thoughts at the same time, two things that don't seem like they go together, holding the complexity of human emotion and of feelings and holding the yes and there's more with an even heavenly attention, an attention that isn't judging but is noticing. It's the liminal. It's the space that says, I don't have an answer. I have these things that I know are true, and that invites God in God's wisdom to help them make sense. Paul, I believe, in this letter and in many of his letters, is trying to help his people open their minds I have a friend, Julie Williams, who is a change consultant. She works specifically in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging fields and helps organizations, systems, and people change. She has this wonderful phrase that she uses to open your aperture. When a conversation is getting too focused, when it's looking too specific, when you're speaking only of things that you have seen forever, she invites you to open your aperture pull back the camera, look for what's on the margins, look beyond the margins and see a fuller picture. I think Paul's doing something similar. And for starters, Paul doesn't take anything for granted. Almost. He takes for granted some really surprising things things that take great faith. Paul takes grace for granted. It's all around us. It's the air we breathe. How could you not understand grace is very much at the essence of Paul's theology. He takes the faith of his people and their love and even the steadfastness of hope for granted that they have. Maybe it's our modern skepticism, or maybe it's our belief that everybody should say who they are themselves, but I don't know many pastors that take the steadfastness of their people's hope for granted. We ask about it, we want to know it, we want to grow it, we want to love it and nurture it and find it and connect it, but I don't take it for granted because I don't know what your Saturday night was or your Sunday morning yet or what phone call you're expecting, or which one you received this morning. I don't yet know where you are or what brings you in. I take your presence as a gift, and my job is to help us find it. I can take love for granted, I can take grace for granted, but not the steadfastness of people. Paul does. And in him saying that everybody is so steadful, I know you are so steadful and faithful and true. He knows this because he says their faith has already come to them. Their faith has come to them by the message of the gospel in words and to the church in Thessalonica, also by the power of the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Now, Paul wasn't there when this happened. Paul hasn't seen it with his own eyes. He wouldn't be able to even if he was standing right there. But Paul takes the conviction of the Holy Spirit to descend with full power as something so obvious that he can brush it aside and say, I take this as the ground on which we stand, so now let's get to work. He takes certain elements of faith for granted. I don't know whether that's wisdom or folly, but it's not how my brain goes, which means I get to sit with Paul and wrestle and try to figure out why does Paul's brain go here? And what is this world that he's trying to envision? And what might happen if we took some things for granted that we don't take for granted and maybe lightened up on some things that we do? What would we have to change? 
Let's start with ourselves. If we take our jobs for granted, or our health, either could go away. If we take our relationships for granted, if we take our friendships and don't tend them, they too can go away. But on the other hand, if we take our relationships as for granted in the way that they are true and steadfast, then maybe we tend to them more. Maybe we are attracted to what is already flourishing and want to help it flourish more. What do we take for granted here, this Sunday morning, where you've wandered into these pews, where you've joined us from across the country? You take for granted that it's 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. You can walk into a church in any city in America and worship. What if worship wasn't at 11 o'clock? What if this building, like our sister Middle Collegiate Church, burned down, like this building did in the 80s? What would we build back? Would we? We can take for granted an entire campus that so many of you who have been journeying with us know we are actively looking to partner with some new organizations to bring some more life into this building, to share our resources, to be a home for more people. We can take it for granted that it's all ours, and that we have to steward it and see it as a great burden. We can take it for granted and see it as an incredible blessing for our time. We're going to be coming to you very soon with some news from our real estate task force and from your consistory as we move towards finalizing some very interesting and promising new arrangements. One of the things that Margaret Tobin doesn't take for granted, Margaret Tobin is the chair of our real estate task force. And we are looking at a number of leases with a number of organizations for three to five years, not a very long time. These are not the long-term saving partners. These may not be partners at all. These might just be tenants. But for three to five years to get us out of this storm, let the economy do whatever it's going to do, let city real estate come back the way that it will, let all of us figure out what we need with buildings to begin with, Margaret likes to remind us all that, you know, we've never had to share. So maybe jumping into bed with somebody for 15 years isn't a really good idea. We might be really bad at it. Let's start with three to five and learn everything that we don't know, like that college freshman roommate that you can't stand by November and you move out and then you find a better roommate. I don't think these are going to be like that, but they might be. We might be really, really bad at this. So let's not take anything for granted, except that we're going to grow and we're going to change. That's something that Scripture has something to say about. Now, as we think about what we can take for granted and what we shouldn't and what we know and what we can test, the Gospel of Matthew gives us this wonderful story of Jesus and the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, you, you know a little bit about who the Pharisees are. The Pharisees are the ancient Jewish scriptural authorities. They're like the bishops. They wear long robes and for the sake of appearances say long prayers in front of their congregations. Their piety is maybe skin deep, maybe heart deep, but their actions often don't match where their intent lies. The Herodians are a worse set altogether. These are followers of Herod the Great, one of the great tyrannizers of ancient Jerusalem and ancient, the ancient Near East. They believe in power and strength. They're Romans. So here Jesus finds himself in a conversation with some really powerful, angry soldiers and the slipperiest of slippery bishops, like Chaucer writes. And now on this day, they like to trick Jesus, they like to ask trick questions, and they've figured out the best one. Should we pay our taxes or not? Highly political question. 
taxes go to Rome, Jerusalem is a colony of Rome, is, is colonized by Rome. If you say no, you will get beheaded. If you say yes, your people won't believe you that freedom is so possible. This is nearly an impossible question. It's a perfect question. There's no right answer for Jesus. The Pharisees and the Herodians have conspired. They know what they're doing. They've got him. And Jesus, clever, wonderful, taking God for granted Jesus as the air that he breathes, responds back with this famous quote that so many of us know. Tell me whose head and whose title are on the coin. And we know, like, oh, it's Rome, obviously, so give the Rome, so render under Caesar. Now, the picture's interesting, right? Like, you know, we've all seen ancient Roman coins. They're around. They're not very valuable. They just kind of sit collecting dust. But there's a picture of the Emperor Tiberius, who's, who's in charge at this moment. The title which everyone would have known, which is why Matthew doesn't preserve it for us, is even more important. The title, like I could say to you, a $20 bill has an image of someone and a quote across the top of it. I wouldn't have to tell you whose picture it is or whose picture it is about to be. And I wouldn't have to tell you that our legal money includes the words in God we trust. To the ancient audience who carried these coins of their colonizers in their pockets and then had to pay them back, nobody had to tell them that inscribed on each coin was Augustus Filii, August Pontifex Maximus. How's your Latin? Translated, it is Tiberius Caesar. Caesar's a title. Tiberius Caesar, son of Caesar son of the divine. In Johannine-like language, in the Gospel of John's language, where we get of the beginning with the word, the Roman money tells us that this is Caesar. This is Tiberius Caesar, who is a son of Caesar, who's a son of God. In Rome, son of God is a human title. This is really hard for us to keep straight most days because we think of Jesus as the Son of God and we think of that as a divine title. In the ancient Near East, this is not true. When you say that someone is a Son of God, you're referring to a king. You're referring to a human person. In the Gospel of Matthew, which is where we find this story today, Jesus doesn't ever refer to himself as the Son of God. His titles, Son of Man, Child of humanity, son of David. A child of humans. We know these are divine titles. Jesus' title is divine because it comes from humanity. Just like last week when Moses' human can help change God's mind, being born of a human and claiming nothing more. You can go about working all the miracles and teaching and healing that you can to change the world. Son of Caesar, son of God. No, says Jesus. Children of man, children of humans, children of the earth that God first made. Here's where it changes. So give to Rome what is Rome's. And give to God, what is God's? This is really, really powerful. And not for the reasons that the Pharisees and the Herodians think is true. Yes, Jesus is getting out of their question. Yes, Jesus has given a perfect answer. Render under Caesar what is Caesar's and render under God what is God's. Fine. We can think about it. We can inscribe it on offering plates. We can give alms and think that we're giving to God what is God's. But there's something in between these two phrases that holds a secret to freedom. We have human responsibilities. We pay taxes. 
We give offerings to support church buildings and church staffs and pay the almighty Con Edison bills. Ministry is something separate. We support it. We offer ourselves and our time and our talents, sure. But when we say that we're rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, we're saying not everything is Caesar's, right? We're saying only give to Caesar what is Caesar's. That stupid coin weighing down your pocket that has his face, not yours, and a title that is his, not God's. Give that back to him. Lighten your load. Jesus is saying you only have to pay the empire or the world or the structure that you live in what is its. That's all. Don't underpay it but also don't overpay it. And what would be an overpayment and overdoing it? Jesus provides this answer too. Rendering unto Caesar what is God's would be overpaying. Giving Caesar or the state or the oppression system that you live in what is not theirs, which is to say you. You, child of God child of humans, belongs to no state. You belong to God. We are all children of other humans, parents. And maybe some of you way back in your genealogical research have found that you may somehow be descended from Augusti Filius II or even Caesar the Great, but I'm guessing most of us aren't. So most of us are not children of Caesar child of God. Most of us, for shorthands, are simply kids of Stephen Wendy, daughters of Van, holders of an inheritance. And most of us know those stories, know our family stories of where we come from and how we got here. And maybe we hold them dear, and maybe there are ones that really hurt us. But in all of that, we are children of humanity, just like Jesus of Nazareth is a child of Mary and Joseph, the carpenter who went with his unmarried wife to a town far away to be registered so that they could pay their taxes, parents of God that they are, to Rome. And so in our humanity, in our finding ourselves as children of other humans, we find ourselves a bit like Christ, a bit divine ourselves, never ones to say it for ourselves, never claiming any title that is beyond ours that is for God to bestow, but that we take up our humanity. And this is where our divinity comes in. We can give to whatever structure, give to your work, give to your employer, give to nine to five, give to it all. But not at 505. That's yours. Yours is the peace that comes from God who has given you the fullness of who you are. Not just what you do to pay the mortgage or buy ever increasingly expensive groceries, though we need those. But here in this scripture, we find Jesus offering an invitation to think of what is yours. The Pharisees and the Herodians don't see this. They see only what is the empire's, how they can protect it, and how they will preserve their oppressive structures and systems against this rebel who's preaching love and justice, who's healing people on the Sabbath, who's telling us that nothing that can go into the body can defile it, for you are perfect in the image of God. That message needed to be stomped down. It still does. Try it out there. Walk out of here and go preach that one, and you'll see it gets stomped down pretty quickly. Try to tell your boss on Tuesday at 2.30 that you can't because you have to go pray. That'll get stomped down pretty quickly. But... There's so much more 
that God has given you that no one, not no one, can take away from you. And Jesus knows it and tells the oppression systems all over the world and throughout all time, stop taking what is not yours. Stop hurting my people. Moses knew it. Let my people go. Jesus knows it. God knows it. And this is as the weather changes and we wear our scarves and get the coats out of the closet. As Christmas decorations come into CVS, as seasons change, we think of God who is coming to be with us yet again and today. And what God gives to you is for no man to take away. Render yourselves to God. For God has created you in the fullness of God's time and out of the vastness of God's imagination and said, you, I need you.